Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, July 14th, 2025. And today we're talking, can I use the rock dust from the well we just dug, the complicated relationship between compost and carbon, and why my pest strategy is so incredibly boring, but it works. So let's do it. All right. Great Monday to you all. I hope everyone had a lovely weekend. Uh, I haven't been outside yet. It's like uh, I'm recording this at 6.08 a.m., but I do believe we got a little rain last night, so that's cool. According to my Precip app, it looks like uh, around half an inch, which, and this may sound weird after getting too much rain for basically every month before the last one, we needed it. Rain and moisture is so wild uh, that way with farming, where one month you can hope it stops and the next month be begging for it. Only way to not sweat it so much is to treat your soil well and build organic matter that will hold uh, the moisture there in the lean times and allow it to pass through in the record-breaking not-so-lean times. Anyway, uh, oh, I wanted to mention that I saw the other day that Dan Breesbois of the Seed Farmer podcast and the book The Seed Farmer just posted a new episode, so go check that out. Subscribe to The Seed Farmer wherever you get your podcasts. Dan is the best, and if you have any interest in seed selling, seed growing, all that stuff, you should check out his book as well. Anyway, uh, so I can't remember if someone sent me this article or uh, I just stumbled upon it, but there was this interesting 19-year study from UC Davis on semi-arid soils conducted in California's northern central valley, which found that, and I'm quoting the UC Davis article about the research, quote, conventional soils neither release nor store much carbon, Cover cropping conventional soils while increasing carbon in the surface 12 inches can actually lose significant amounts of carbon below that depth. And when both compost and cover crops were added in the organic certified system, soil carbon content increased 12.6% over the length of the study or about 0.07% annually. It is far more carbon stored than would be calculated if only the surface layer was measured, end quote. So that's kind of interesting. And let's go back through each of those. Conventional soils in the study neither releasing nor storing much carbon. Is, I, I guess in some ways that's just not really a surprise, I suppose. If there is not much carbon there to begin with, like in the soil, nor much carbon being added, I guess what's to lose? The second finding that cover cropping conventionally managed soils built increased uh, carbon in the top 12 inches but lost significant amounts of carbon below that depth is definitely pretty interesting. Reading through the methodology there, they use synthetic fertilizers in that system, so taking much from the cover crop's role in the soil loss deep down is hard to do reliably, uh, but the idea that when you use both cover crops and compost, in this case a compost to chicken manure, together you get a really significant boost in soil carbon. Well, that's that's not super surprising, but it is very cool to see that. Uh, it's exciting to see some numbers put behind this idea that cover crops are cool, but compost and cover crops together are something else entirely. We touched on this idea a bit when I was discussing the Haney test last week with Dr. Patrick Fries, and it seems to me that the approach of incorporating even a small amount of compost in with your cover cropping as a fertility approach is excellent and can boost the efficacy of both. Uh, there is even some evidence that the combo can help suppress human pathogens, uh, not from this study, but from another one. One six-year study I found itself revealed that compost and cover crops help to improve the enzymatic activity that leads to good nutrient cycling over just uh, cover crops and or just compost. And notably, the types of cover crops had little influence, so it didn't really matter which cover crops they were using. So I guess in effect, if you have the space, you should probably be using cover crops and if you have a little compost to spare, you should probably be adding that in there as well. Those cover crops will help to make your uh, the nutrients available to your next crops, uh, store some carbon for you, keep the soil in place. Super generous, those cover crops. Now, what does using compost and cover crops together look like exactly? Well, it varies a little bit uh, in the literature, but generally they're using a little bit of chicken manure during the growing season for a cash crop and then a cover crop over the winter. In other words, it doesn't even have to be composting with the cover crop like getting the bed prepped, putting some compost down, and then using a cover crop. Doesn't have to be that way. This study is basically suggesting that compost and cover crops used uh, together in the same season have that beneficial effect. So I guess you could kind of look at it like the cash crop gets the immediate bulk release of the nutrients in the compost, and then the cover crop gets the slower release stuff uh, later on to recycle. In other words, sure, you can use the compost with your cover crops. I, I mean, that would be cool, but it's more about using cover crops 
and compost within the same year. Therefore, you don't necessarily have to use your good compost on your cover crops, though that would be fine, I guess. And indeed, sometimes I will or I will add uh, compost slurries to cover crop stands because cover crops need love too. But we should all be looking for ways to incorporate both. All right. Interesting. Reassuring. I've long thought that a system could be entirely reliant on cover crops and maybe to some extent it could be. Uh, and of course, studies in different climates might yield different results because farming is super straightforward like that. But it seems there is always a place for at least a small amount of compost in your cover cropping systems. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on that. And up next, we will talk about leftovers from a well. BRB. Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. If you're listening to this, you probably found five rare minutes to breathe, but what got pushed back further down the to-do list to make that happen? If it's your CSA newsletter, you're not alone. Farmhand's new newsletter builder was made for busy farmers. It automates weekly emails, drives add-on sales, and makes it easy to keep your customers in the loop without spending hours behind a screen. It launches this summer, but our listeners can request early access now. Visit farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no till growers. Does this podcast bring you $2 worth of value a month? Five? You can show that by signing up. I will try to get to questions from everywhere the questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes to us from Patreon member Lee Kossib, who writes, quote, Hello, we just had a well drilled, and there are probably two trash cans full of rock dust sitting on the ground now. Ever heard of sprinkling such dust on the garden for minerals? Not all at once, but like scoop it up and keep it for long-term mineral amendment. The driller said he thought it was a lot of granite and quartz mixed with other types of rock. Thanks for being awesome. Also, just one person's perspective, but love the way you did the show this week with the guest speakers. Totally not opposed to shows that are recorded back to back and shown daily, if that makes sense. Can imagine that making the daily show much more sustainable for you for what it's worth. Smiley face emoji, end quote. All right, thanks, Lee. An interesting question here. And indeed, we also love doing the interviews. I mean, one, they're good education for me. Two, they're a lot of fun to do. I like talking to people. Uh, and they aren't necessarily less work time-wise, but they are a nice change of pace. Uh, so we will continue to bring those as often as we can. Now, first thing I will say is that if you haven't already, I would cover that rock dust pile with a tarp or something uh, to keep it from blowing around on windier days so that you're not breathing it in or losing it and without knowing exactly what that raw dust is specifically you said quartz and some granite but it's hard to say what it might add to your gardens without knowing exactly what the makeup is so it might be worth at least investigating a little bit more what the bedrock is made of in your area and then checking online to see what the nutrient makeup of that bedrock is and how it might change the nutrient composition and or ph of your soil but it's not as simple as say granite and quartz might add some acidity to the C to the ph or shale for instance if that's in there whereas limestone might add a little bit of alkalinity uh, the types of granite shale, quartz, limestone, basalt, all that stuff matters in terms of how they might change the pH or nutrient makeup. Calcitic limestone, for instance, is limestone that is high in calcium carbonate, whereas dolomitic limestone is calcium carbonate also, but with a healthy dose of magnesium carbonate as well, which means it's high in magnesium on top of the calcium. If your soil is already rich in magnesium, for instance, you might not want to add dolomitic limestone dust in great quantities, though uh, some agronomists don't really worry a ton about this, but an agronomist will be able to better advise you on that than I will. The application rate and health of the soil, as well as your climate and rainfall, will also determine how available the nutrients are. For instance, especially in conjunction with soil tests, it's a common practice to add rock minerals to soils as a fertilizing approach. But if the microbes are not there to help release the nutrients from those minerals in adequate numbers, then at least when someone is buying uh, rock dusts, they've just added an expensive uh, dusting of nothing. 
Uh, my take on rock minerals is, well, first, consult with an agronomist to make sure you're not doing anything weird to the soil that may leave it terribly unbalanced. But generally, I prefer to add them to a compost pile in relatively small amounts and let those microbes help make the nutrients available for the plants. Uh, for me, that cuts down on the cost of the rock minerals because I don't feel I need to use as much. Uh, plus, the results, at least anecdotally, have been good in terms of addressing, say, specific nutrient deficiencies I might be seeing in some plants. So I guess the short answer is, uh, yes, you can use the rock dust perhaps, but just know what you're working with specifically and then maybe get a small soil test and check with an agronomist before you put too much of it on your gardens. But you may find uh, you not only have a new well, but a new wealth of bonus nutrients. See what I did there? Score. Great question as always, Lee. And let me know, commenters, what else you might add to this topic. I need to do more shows on soil testing and rock minerals and all those good things because it comes up a lot uh, at some point. So Patreon questions is a good way to always push me into talking about it, just saying. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will stop overthinking pests. Or will we? I mean, I won't. That's kind of my job. Anyway, be right back. All right, so I get a lot of questions about this or that pest and what to do about it. So I look into the research on preventing said pest and the research often demonstrates the most incredibly basic ideas. For instance, uh, thrips are a pest that will often hit alliums and other crops really hard. What does the research suggest we should do to prevent them? Quoting one paper, quote, the use of straw mulches and flower strips resulted in reduced thrip density and higher onion yields were observed, end quote. Another paper I saw discussed the effect that earthworms had on helping tomatoes defend themselves from thrips. So biodiversity, healthy soil, and keeping the soil covered helps. I know. It's shocking. You can do that with practically any pest, frankly, and uh, when you really dig into the literature, maintaining good biodiversity around the crop, uh, good soil management practices, and those sorts of things, and your pest pressure will go down. At worst, if you couple those things with some sort of exclusion netting, especially in the early years of a garden when you're working to get the soil up and running, much of the problem can be reduced or eliminated, depending on the pest. Now, I don't like to be flippant about these things. There are going to be growers who do everything right and still have issues with certain pests. I do a lot of work on uh, our soil and local ecology and all those things, and we still get pests from time to time. I mentioned earlier this year that I had some potato beetles, but I also know those potatoes were planted in the worst draining part of our gardens. So I didn't think I need to treat that beetle. I thought I need to keep working on that soil and that plot and also probably not plant spring potatoes there. Effectively, pests can come for a lot of different reasons and most of them the farmer can manage preemptively. Part of it may be the specific crop that's chosen for that region. Maybe there's something in the soil just not available to the plant because not enough moisture or not enough microbes or not enough organic matter or whatever. Maybe the plant is just stressed by the climate for some reason. But by and large, what I see time and again when it comes to pest management is this. Your soil should be as loose as it can be, uh, fertile with compost and cover crops as the focal point in the same year, it seems, with uh, well-maintained drainage and crops should receive adequate moisture and be planted at the appropriate times of day and year to avoid excessive stress. Mulches can help manage both of those things. Uh, when used correctly. Various flowers and shrubs should be in abundance throughout the farm. Synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides should be avoided to risk increasing pest pressure. The soil should not be overworked to maintain good structure. Soil life and soil organic matter as well. All that to say, as annoying as it feels when you have a pest, and to be sure, I get pests from time to time, and they are annoying, I can attest, Oftentimes, the solution is pretty straightforward soil management. If the issues continue, look for crops with higher resistance to said pest, bred into them, or simply try varieties 
uh, better adapted to your area. Exclusion netting is an effective, longer lasting alternative to pesticides to have on hand for emergent issues and can help uh, to establish crops as well, especially in the early years of a garden when the soil may not be up to the task just yet. But also some years are just more stressful on the same plants. So it's nice to have exclusion netting around and also flea beetles. Flea beetles are just going to Swiss cheese stuff because that's what they, that's how they roll. So those are things that pest management really all comes down to. And that's not just me proselytizing or telling stories. More often than not, that's what the research finds as well. That said, I'd love to hear your stories, both successes and failures when it comes to working on soil health and habitat when it, and how that relates to pests. What have you observed? What's a pest that, try as you might, just does not seem to be getting the memo? Let me know. And otherwise... I think we're done here Monday. Don't forget, No-Till Growers is now officially a nonprofit 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. You can learn more about how to do that in the show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor this show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at NoTillGrowers.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing, and the team at No-Till Growers. Also shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a hat like this one or a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level or if you just bump up from one level to another or you sign up in the month of July, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Rolando. Rolando, that's awesome. And David Ralston, Ralston, Ralston. I think I probably got it. Thanks, you all. Uh, all right, so this week, uh, our story is about a man who has a very specific affliction. Every day when he wakes up, he still recognizes everything around him. He recognizes his wife, and he recognizes his kids, and he knows their names, and he, and he knows his dog. But what he doesn't know is what his profession is. But not like he forgets it. Like, he literally has a new set of skills every single day. Like a new profession is embedded in his brain. And it's been like that since he was uh, 20 years old. He turned 20 and suddenly every single morning he wakes up with an entirely new and relatively complete ability to do a totally different job. It may be something related to carpentry. It may be a hyper-specific, I don't know, computer programming job or a street sweeper, or he may know how to be the fullback for Brighton and Hove Albion. Could be anything. But this day, well, this day, what he wakes up as was something altogether new, and well, that is for tomorrow on The Game Changer. Actually, I think I feel like that one works. All right, thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.